Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. I'm your host, Tom Fress, and I'll be with you for the next hour here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. And I wish to thank all those who have kept me in prayer over these months and uh, pray that you continue to do so as God leads and directs and I continue in his service here on Inquisition Update. This morning, I would like to introduce a new book. It's entitled The Global Vatican, and it was written by a former ambassador to the Holy See, a former U.S. ambassador to the Holy See, that is, to the Vatican. His name was Francis Rooney, and as many of you know, my regular listeners know that for nearly a decade here on First Amendment Radio, on Inquisition Update, I've been proving from Scripture and from history, that the office of the papacy is, was, and always has been, and always will be what the Bible describes as the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, the biblical, prophetic, and uh, historical Antichrist. And that futurism is a lie, this idea that the Antichrist doesn't come until the last seven years or so before Christ's return, is simply to take the world's eyes away from the historical Antichrist, the papacy. And that it was the main tenet of Protestantism that the papacy, and only the papacy, could fulfill the prophetic role of the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition in the Bible. That is the Protestant belief. And if one does not believe that the papacy is the Antichrist, then one can hardly call himself a Protestant. I hope that doesn't offend my listeners. It's just a matter of fact. And it's a researchable fact. All we have to do is study the historical writings of the Protestant reformers and see that the basic tenet of Protestantism was that belief, that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of the Bible. I've proven from history and from the Scripture that it is the papacy. But many people, despite all of those years of programs, all of that education, are still doubtful, still believing in a future Antichrist, and that it cannot be the papacy. Well... I'm here to tell you the Bible talks about that man that rules over the kings of the earth. And again, with words from a Roman Catholic, a devout Roman Catholic, one who was assigned by the Bush administration to be the U.S. ambassador to the Holy See, is going to reveal in this book that not only does the papacy rule over the kings of the earth, he rules over the king of the United States. And that the papacy largely determines both foreign and domestic policy for this country. Let me read that again. Read my lips. The papacy, the Holy See, the governing body of the Roman Catholic Church, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist of the Bible, dictates both foreign and domestic policy for the United States of America. Now, this isn't just Tom Fress speaking. This is going to be evident from the content of this book by the Roman Catholic U.S. ambassador to the, to the Roman Catholic Church, to the Vatican, to the Holy See, Francis Rooney, in his own book. Okay? I mean, if, if, if a man stands up and says, I am the Antichrist, we ought to at least take a a glancing look, shouldn't we? This man's going to admit how much power and influence the Vatican has exerted upon this country almost since its founding. And that the Vatican is regarded as one of the three superpowers in in the world. A superpower that outdates all other superpowers. The first superpower, the Vatican. And we're going to discover an unholy relationship between 
the two biggest superpowers in the world. The ones which I call the beast and the image of the beast. One is the Vatican and the other is the American government. Startling realities in this book. And I read this book because it has huge significance in light of the fact that the current Antichrist, Francis I, Antichrist Francis I, for the first time in U.S. history, is being invited to the United States to speak to a joint session of Congress. In a country that was established, was established on separation of church and state, and a non-establishment clause, that there should not be an established religion for this country. The United States, once Protestant, once protested the Antichrist of the Bible, has now invited the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist of the Bible, to come and speak to a joint session of Congress this fall. And you might ask, what would the Antichrist do if he had an opportunity to expose his role as the rulers of the kings of the earth? I think that ought to be a prime consideration and prime concern for Americans, both Roman Catholic and Protestant. We used to think that we had some say in government. History and the Bible and this book is going to reveal that the people do not have a say. And uh, it's a hideous reality. I know I've used that term to describe this before. But the more and more I research this, the more and more I study it, it it's a mind-boggling state of affairs for Bible-believing Protestants in this country. Few as there be, may be, <clears throat> so, in preparing God's people, and you know who you are, Bible-believing Protestant people, for what may bode in our immediate future, I'm going to read this book and keep you, keep your minds focused on what Francis I might say or do both publicly and privately in Washington, D.C. this fall. And what consequences may bode for God's people. Remember, the Antichrist slays God's people. The Antichrist persecutes God's people. The Antichrist silences the Bible. Anybody who reads it, he is the enemy of God, and therefore the enemy of God's people. What will this Pope say to our joint session of Congress? What will he say in private session after he is addressed publicly? We'll get an idea what those things might be by the reading of this book. Now, on the cover of the book it says, in an inside look at the Catholic Church, world politics, and the extraordinary relationship between the United States and the Holy See. The Global Vatican is the title of it. The author is Ambassador Francis Rooney, and it continues a forward by Roman, a former, also former Roman Catholic or uh, uh, Ambassador John Negroponte. Roman Catholic. Ambassador John Negroponte. Now, on the inside flap, it says, From the centuries-long prejudices against Catholics in America to the efforts of fascism, communism, and modern terrorist organizations to, quote-unquote, break the cross and spill the wine, unquote, this book brings to life the Catholic Church's role in world history particularly in the realm of diplomacy. Former U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See, Francis Rooney, provides a comprehensive guide to the remarkable path the Vatican has navigated to the present day 
and a first-person account of what that path looks and feels like from an, an American diplomat whose experience lent him the ultimate insider's perspective. Part memoir, part historical lesson, the global Vatican captures the braided nature of religious and political power and the complexities, battles, and future prospects for the relationship between the Holy See and the United States as both face challenges old and new. Francis Rooney was the United States Ambassador to the Holy See from 2005 to 2008. He is the CEO of Rooney Holdings. A highly accomplished man, a dedicated Roman Catholic, and former ambassador from the United States government to the Holy See. My listeners have to be asking themselves, why does the United States, whose constitution is based on a non-establishment clause, establishing formal diplomatic ties with the Vatican. Never mind that the Pope is the the papacy is the Antichrist of the Bible. Why would a republic such as ours, with such a rich Protestant beginning, tolerate the United States government entering formal diplomatic relations with the man of sin. Non-establishment clause. Are they trying to make us all Catholic without our knowledge? I think this book will reveal a hideous reality. Now, the foreword of the book is written, again, by John Negroponte, a former U.S. ambassador, a devout Roman Catholic, and I think you'll find this foreword also very interesting. He says, many, if not most, U.S. diplomats have at least some dealings with their Vatican counterparts during the course of their foreign service careers. For my part, I witnessed the leadership role played by papal nuncios in assignments to three different countries in Latin America. At other postings, such as Vietnam in the 1960s, remember we read right here on Inquisition Update the book entitled Vietnam, Why Did We Go? by Avril Manhattan, we discovered that the Vietnam War was literally a Holy Roman Crusade led by the United States to put down the legitimate government of Vietnam, and to install a Roman Catholic dictatorship. That's what it was. To make Vietnam Catholic. And this author mentions the Vietnam War. He says, at other postings such as Vietnam in the 1960s and Iraq in the, dec- in the last decade, <clears throat> I witnessed the plight of Catholic populations frightened and uprooted by ideological and sectarian conflict. And I was privileged to meet Pope John Paul II during his pastoral visits to three of my ambassadorial postings, Honduras, Mexico, and the Philippines. One has to personally witness such a papal visit to a predominantly Roman Catholic country to appreciate the enormous spiritual and emotional influence these events can have on a country. I first met Ambassador Francis Rooney in June of 2007 when I accompanied President Bush on his visit to Rome and the Vatican. Both of us escorted President and Mrs. Bush on their call on Pope Benedict, and as it turned out, both of us were with the President after leaving the Vatican during these uh, during those tense moments when his limousine momentarily stalled on the way to our next destination. I appreciated then and have come to appreciate more Ambassador Rooney's thoughtful, even scholarly approach to his assignment. 
What he has done in this book is to provide us with a very readable account of the U.S.-Vatican relationships since the founding of our nation. He also traces the growing importance over time of the Catholic Church in our country. Ambassador Rooney intertwines this very interesting history with relevant reflections and anecdotes from his tour of duty as our envoy to the Vatican. In this era of globalization, it is key to remember that the Catholic Church has been a global institution for centuries. Now, what has Negroponte just told you? Let me read it again. I want you to think for yourself. Listen carefully what Negroponte is saying. In this era of globalization, it is key to remember that the Catholic Church has been a global institution for centuries. That's an admission that globalization is authored by the global institution called the Vatican. After all, the Bible confirms he reigns over the kings of the earth. Look, for those who are having trouble doing the math, the new world order is simply the old world order restored on a global basis. The old world order is when the king of kings, the self-styled king of kings and lord of lords, the papacy, ruled over the kings of Europe and used the civil powers of all the nations to persecute God's people, to destroy the Bible, to, to hold God's people in the Inquisition, to be tortured and tormented and finally killed. And that era of darkness, when the Bible was suppressed and the Roman Catholic Church held sway over the governments of the earth, a true Bible-believing Christian lived every day in fear of his life. Well, that horror, called the Dark Ages by some, was overturned at the Protestant Reformation. When God's people, for the first time in centuries, were able to read the Bible for themselves in their own languages, and to read it for themselves and to understand what God was saying. No more were they spoon-fed by the Roman Catholic priests and believed and taught to believe lies. They read it for themselves, and they instantly and unanimously recognized that the Bible described no one else but the papacy as that man of sin, the son of perdition, and they left the Roman Catholic Church in droves, and they overthrew their papally controlled governments, and they liberated the vast majority of Europe. And some of those liberators came to this country seeking religious liberty from Roman Catholic tyranny and persecution and torture. This Negroponte is telling us that this new globalization is led by the papacy, is led by the Vatican. And you have to realize that a global kingdom is what the papacy seeks. It's what he has always sought, to be the king of kings and the lord of lords. To create an earthly kingdom in contradistinction to the heavenly one. And globalization, globalization is just the instrument, one of the many multitudes of instruments through which the papacy seeks to accomplish that, get, that, that end. A global government under the head of the papacy where all the kings of the earth and all their nations kowtow to his will in contradistinction to Christ's will. First there is Christ, 
Then there is his counterpart, the Antichrist. First, there is a heavenly kingdom and a counterfeit earthly kingdom. One is led by Christ, the other is led by Antichrist. <clears throat> Globalization is not our friend. The new world order is not our friend because the old world order was not our friend. The papacy is not Christ. The papacy is Antichrist. And this global government and this globalization is the architecture of Rome. Negroponte says, in the era of globalization, it is key to remember, it is key to remember that the Catholic Church has been a global institution for centuries. That fact, combined with the growing numbers of Catholics in the United States, now he doesn't go on to mention that it's because of the overwhelming flood of, of, of Roman Catholics from the southern border, Mexico, Central and South America, flooding into this country. He doesn't, he doesn't tell you why America is becoming more and more and more Catholic, but it's because of that open border. Nonetheless, he said, with growing numbers of Catholics in the United States, now some 25% of the adult population makes understanding the Vatican and its policies an ever more important part of our diplomacy. What did uh, John Negroponte just tell you? America is becoming more and more Roman Catholic. It is already 25% Roman Catholic and it's more and more important now for Americans to understand the Vatican and its policies. Why? Because it's going to be the government of this country in the New World Order. Again, he says, the fact, combined with the growing numbers of Catholics in the United States, now some 25% of the adult population, makes understanding the Vatican and its policies, that is, its laws, Roman Catholic canon law, an ever more important part of our diplomacy. I'll tell you something else that uh, John Negroponte doesn't mention. And that is since... Futurism, the idea that the papacy is not the Antichrist, but it is a single individual that doesn't come on the world scene until just seven years before Christ's return. Now that they believe in a future Antichrist and have exonerated the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist of the Bible, he's now able to take over our country to dictate our policies. And Vatican Council II, that took place during the 1960s, was simply a recognition of the fact that Protestants, quote-unquote, no longer protest the papacy because they believe in a future Antichrist and therefore have exonerated the papacy. And so, therefore, reason dictates that if they left the Roman Catholic Church believing the Pope was the Antichrist, they no longer believe the Pope is the Antichrist, they ought to come back to the Roman Catholic Church. So that 25% are just simply the card-carrying Roman Catholics. Think of the percentage of the American population that are now ecumenical Catholics that once called themselves Protestant. What? is the percentage of Romanists in this country today. Okay, welcome back to First Amendment Radio. You're listening to Inquisition Update and your host, Tom Fress. If you'd like to contact me with comments or questions, please do so by emailing me, tom at seawaves.us. That's tom at s-e-a-w-a-v-e-s dot us. And uh, I'll be happy to answer all of your questions uh, or at least emails that uh, require a response. I want to, you know, begin the second half by rereading this last paragraph. 
It says, in this era of globalization, it is key to remember that the Catholic Church has been a global institution for centuries. That fact, combined with the growing numbers of Catholics in the United States, now some 25% of the adult population, makes understanding the Vatican and its policies an ever more important part of our diplomacy. Ambassador Rooney's book is an important contribution to that understanding. Signed, John Negroponte, former Deputy Secretary of State, Washington, D.C., dated June of 2013. John Negroponte, a devout Roman Catholic, chief in the, in the uh, Secretary of State, Deputy Secretary of State, one of the highest offices in our in our land that establishes foreign policy, valuing the importance of globalization, the fact that the Roman Catholic Church was the first global organization, according to him, the fact that at least 25% of the adult population of the United States is Roman Catholic, that Roman Catholics are flooding in from the south, Mexico, Central and South America. America is becoming more and more Roman Catholic every day. And that now, especially since Vatican Council II, when the Protestants repudiated Protestantism, and accepted futurism and exonerated the papacy and no longer believe that the papacy is the Antichrist and are going home to the Roman Catholic Church, literally undoing the Protestant Reformation and spitting in the face of all the martyrs of Jesus. Now, it's more important for Americans to understand the Vatican, and its policies. So says Roman Catholic John Negroponte, former Deputy Secretary of State of the United States. Does that make the hair stand on the back of your neck? I suggest to you that if it doesn't, then you are not a regular listener of Inquisition Update, nor do you have a workable grasp of history, nor a workable grasp of the Scriptures. And if you listen to Inquisition Update, I'll help, with God's help, fix, remedy that illness. Now, the prologue of the book is entitled, Introduction to an Education. This is written by the author, Francis Rooney, former U.S. ambassador to the Holy See, the so-called Holy See. There's nothing more unholy in the world than the Antichrist and his government. He says, Monsignor Caputo came to Villa Richardson on a bright morning in late October, two days after my wife Kathleen and I landed in Rome to begin my appointment as the U.S. ambassador to the Holy See. An aide led him up the short flight of stairs to the sunroom at the back of the residence where we were still unpacking boxes. As I shook the Monsignor's hand, he struck me as a man well suited to his position as the Vatican's head of protocol. He was tall, with neatly clipped black hair and a calm demeanor, fully at ease, yet not a bit informal. Like many Vatican officials, he had been educated in the Pontifical Ecclesiastical Academy, the esteemed 300-year-old diplomatic school associated with the Vatican, and was fluent in four languages. His English, like everything else about him, was impeccable. Mr. Ambassador, he announced after we'd exchanged a few pleasantries, I have the honor of informing you that the Holy Father will grant an audience for your credentialing on the morning of Saturday, November 12th, unquote. I should point out that in the 48 hours between our arrival in Rome and Monsignor Tommaso Caputo's visit that morning, I had already learned a few important lessons about this new job. 
I had learned, for example, that when a new U.S. ambassador to the Holy See lands at Rome's Fiumicino Airport, he is immediately escorted off the plane by Italian police and taken to a private lounge where he is greeted by various dignitaries and the press and expected to deliver a coherent speech. Diplomacy is a serious matter in Italy, and much attention is focused on any ambassador representing the United States. Why would that be? If the United States were not vitally important to the Vatican's foreign policy agenda, that is, the Vatican's global agenda. Something else I had learned since our landing was that American ambassadors to the Holy See have many privileges, but the ability to move freely about Rome is not one of them. From the moment we arrived, every step outside the confines of the residence or the embassy had to be coordinated with the embassy's security detail. We would come to be highly appreciative of the embassy staff and the Italian Secret Service for their capable execution of the security regimen, but it took a bit of getting used to in those early days. I knew the learning curve would be steep in Rome, but I had arrived as prepared as possible. My Catholic background from my long-ago Sunday mornings as an altar boy at Sacred Heart Church in Muskogee, Oklahoma, through my education by the Jesuits at Georgetown Preparatory School and Georgetown University in Washington was a good start. Now, let me stop. I've said repeatedly for over a decade, nearly a decade rather, on Inquisition Update here on First Amendment Radio, that Georgetown University, one of 28 of the most prestigious Roman Catholic universities in this country, probably the chiefest of all the Jesuit universities in this country, Georgetown University, its purpose is to cultivate the cream of the intellectual crop of Americans, Protestant and Catholic and give them a Jesuit education. Now, what's a Jesuit education? Well, it's all about globalism. It's all about a global government. It's all about eventually overthrowing this Protestant constitutional republic and lumping it into a global fold, destroying its borders, and making the United States just one of many nations serving one man. And at the, while, while proclaiming universal religious liberty all over the world, that it's okay to be any religion you want, but you must obey this global government that they're trying to establish. Now, once they receive this Jesuit education in Jesuit Georgetown University, they're immediately shuffled off to the highest positions in our federal government. Now, if you want to maintain the United States sovereignty, if you want to maintain the right to your own religious beliefs, in other words, my right to be a protestant, then you wouldn't want any graduate from Jesuit Georgetown University occupying any position of authority in this country and especially not the highest offices in our federal government. If I could just tell you my heart of hearts here, my heart of hearts, no Roman Catholic, Jesuit education, Jesuit education or not, could occupy any position of authority in this country because their position always is obedience to the quote-unquote Holy Father, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. And they're going to achieve 
that obedience not only for themselves but for you as well by fashioning the laws and the policies of this country, both federal, state, county, and local municipal laws consistent with Roman Catholic canon law so that you can profess Protestantism till the cows come home, but every law that is established in this country makes you Catholic. So you're Protestant by name only. But you are made to obey Roman Catholic canon law through the civil law. Just exactly like it was in the old world order. The civil laws of all the nations of Europe under the papacy's control conformed all Europeans to Roman Catholic canon law. And anybody who disobeyed the law that is, Roman Catholic canon law, was deemed a heretic and was rounded up by the government and was persecuted and killed and burned at the stake. And they were doing the bidding of that man of sin, the son of perdition, the one who's guilty of the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus Christ. And that's John Negroponte's duty in life. That's Francis Rooney's duty in life. That is the duty in life of every Roman Catholic, whether he accepts that duty and takes it seriously or not. But let me tell you, Washington is crawling with quote-unquote Americans who are first and foremost papists. And through the civil laws through foreign policy, through domestic policy, they are making us all Catholic, whether we profess Protestantism or not. By force, I am I'm being made to comply with Roman Catholic canon law, to hell with God's law, to hell with the Bible, and I must serve Antichrist with my hands and my feet. I can profess Christ with my mouth all I want, but I am forced by the civil government of this land, federal, state, county, and local, to be Roman Catholic in practice. And I protest that. Just like my Protestant forefathers who died at the hands of these papists, who were considered by their papal government to be anarchists. They would rather obey God than men. They protested the papacy's control over the governments and the kings of the earth. And they won for me, or at least generations of Christians after them, freedom from papal antichrist tyranny. And it is these people, graduates of Georgetown University, occupying the highest positions in our government, that are undoing the Protestant Reformation, bringing Roman Catholicism to this land, and making Protestantism outlawed. And we're going to be called radical fundamentalists. We're going to be called Bible bumpers. We're going to be called anarchists. But we will not bend the knee to Baal. I hope you're with me. He says, I knew the learning curve would be steep in Rome, but I had arrived as prepared as possible. My Catholic background from my long-ago Sunday mornings as an altar boy at the Sacred Heart Catholic Church in Muskogee, Oklahoma, through my education by the Jesuits at Georgetown Preparatory School and Georgetown University in Washington was a good start. After law school and prior to the Vatican, I, divided, I devoted most of my life together with Kathleen to building a family and a group of businesses. 
My career took me to many parts of the world, especially in Latin America, and gave me the opportunity to see firsthand the issues facing a church serving more than a billion members in 196 countries. So there's testimony of the global church and its global occupation of 196 countries in this world. I think Francis Rooney probably values more than anything else his role and membership in that global superpower, Roman Catholic Church, and the honor of serving this nation as ambassador to the greatest superpower in the world, the Vatican. Now, my listeners can roll their eyes all they want, but it's simply out of ignorance. And you can be forgiven for ignorance, but stupidity is inexcusable. This information is too much available. The Bible describes it. History describes it. We are no longer to be comfortable being ignorant of these most consequential facts. He continues, he says, After President George W. Bush appointed me as ambassador to the Holy See in the winter of 2005, and prior to Senate confirmation and our departure for Rome, Kathleen and I had both launched into a crash course in church history, that is, Roman Catholic Church history, and Vatican diplomacy, aided by a comprehensive reading listed, uh, a, a comprehensive reading list, listen to this, provided by the State Department. Now look, he works for the Department of State, ambassador to the Holy See. He should know his business, and surely the State Department would provide him a lot of reading material. But the reading material was about the history of the Roman Catholic Church and Vatican diplomacy. What, what's the federal government doing, uh, you know, advocating the study of, uh, of Roman Catholic Church history? Is that the business of government? I would say, well, come on, Tom. He's going to be ambassador to the Vatican. Certainly ought to know something about Roman Catholic Church history. Well, is he representing the United States to the Roman Catholic Church? Or is he just simply representing the United States to a, a well, a 109-acre monarchy? See, don't be confused. The United States would have you believe that its concern is only with the temporal government, the civil government, the monarchical government of Vatican City, which is 109 acres, while it instead is the right arm of the Roman Catholic Church, which is global, which we are protected from by the separation clause of the Constitution and the non-establishment clause. There should be a wall of separation between church and state, right? And there should be no establishment of a religion in the United States. So while you're led to believe that it's just one nation doing business with another nation of a mere 109 acres, what in fact is going on is the image of the beast serving its master the beast. I mean, many of my listeners must wonder, well, why does every president of the United States go to the Vatican, Vatican City, when it's only 109 acres? The Pope is the king there. Uh, why does he spend so much time? Why does every president go? And why do they wear black when they go? 
are they going to just see a king of a a little country of 109 acres and pay their respects to another sovereign? Or are they going to get their orders from the king of kings and the lord of lords of this global antichrist kingdom called the New World Order? You be the judge. I think you already know what I believe. And if you're a regular uh, listener to Inquisition Update, you certainly know what I believe. He says, the State Department, of course, has a program of ensuring that incoming ambassadors receive the information they need to be effective upon arrival. This includes consultations with various policy experts in areas of concern to the Vatican mission. He never says what the Vatican mission is, but it says areas of concern to the Vatican mission and others within the department who work to support our missions, our missions abroad. You ever get to think that maybe they're one and the same? The Vatican's mission and our mission, our foreign policy missions are one and the same? I'm suggesting to you that they are, and that's why the Vatican is so important to the State Department of the United States. That's why they send ambassadors from this country, once who protested the Antichrist of the Bible, who would never establish formal diplomatic relations, much less exchange nuncios and ambassadors, and certainly above all, would never allow the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist to set foot on this nation, much less to lead a joint session of Congress this fall. He says, this includes consultations with various policy experts in areas of concern to the Vatican mission and others within the department who work to support our missions abroad. There was also a two-week, quote-unquote, ambassador seminar conducted in the State Department's main building at the George P. Schultz National Foreign Affairs Training Center in Arlington, Virginia, where Kathleen and I were joined by several other newly appointed ambassador designates and their spouses. In addition to the State Department program, I was fortunate to receive generous help and advice from former Holy See ambassadors, church leaders. Now, you must know that he's not talking about Baptist church leaders, Roman Catholic church leaders and scholars. By the time we landed in Rome, I was confident that I had a pretty good grasp of the task before me, but I also had plenty more to learn. Back to that October morning in 2005. Monsignor Caputo was officially inviting me to my first official public function as ambassador, the occasion when I would present my credentials to Pope Benedict XVI and receive in return his sanction and blessing. Of course, you know, we all need Pope Benedict XVI's sanction and blessing, don't we? In this new Catholic country? That's coming this fall when Pope Francis I addresses a joint session of the kings of this country. Credentialing is a highly ceremonial affair, but is also substantive. A rare private audience with the Pope, this would be an opportunity to make a positive first impression and articulate goals and objectives of the Bush administration, which might resonate with the Holy See. This would be one of the most important days of my term as ambassador, and a remarkable moment for my family. So it was inconceivable for us to meet the Pope without our children present. Our eldest son, Larry, was out of school and working a new job in Chicago. His brother, Michael, and sister, Kathleen, was still in college. And we'll continue our reading and discussion of the book, The Global Vatican, on Inquisition Update tomorrow. You've been listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. I'm your host, Tom Fress. We'll see you then. <laughs> 